because I wanted to find out more or understand more about the pathfinding abilities of the Viterbi algorithm, I decided to put a Roomba vacuum cleaner, the automated ones, in Lewisham Shopping Centre with the camera on it, just to see what happens with a pathfinding algorithm there. I was cheating a bit in that I didn't know that the Viterbi was incorporated in the Roomba, but I was going a bit nuts reading these mathematical papers and not really understanding how I just needed something physical. So, a video clip here. But yeah, I sent this Roomba vacuum cleaner around to just see what pathfinding does. I don't know how far I particularly got with that. It was a practical experiment. And I, I suppose that's part... So when you say pathfinding, that, I mean, I thought previously what you were doing were you had some kind of statistical model kind of saying, you know, of all the possible routes through here, this is the most likely one that the signal is really trying to tell us. Yeah. So and how do you turn that into some <coughs> sense of looking at the world and saying, shall I go left or right <coughs> to avoid... Because what I deduce from reading about the algorithm used within the program, used within the Roomba vacuum cleaner, is that it starts to build an image of the most likely size of a room. And it alters how it navigates across that space depending on the information that it receives. So it's, it's building multiple rival models of what the room is like and where the obstacles are. Yeah. And then it's starting, the more it bumps into, the more it kind of refines that model. Yeah. That's, that's actually an LED on top of a Roomba vacuum cleaner as it moves around space. Okay. So you can see, that it's not I didn't do that, it was somebody who had done it on the web. It was great to actually see an algorithm in action, because I was, I was like, it's so abstract reading mathematical papers, and I was just trying to look, how can I visualise or get a sense of what the Viterbi is doing? So I went down that route. And I was amazed at how modular the... Uh, room for vacuum cleaner was, and discovered that it's made by the largest military robotics manufacturer in the US. Well, I mean, presumably more importantly, it's made, it's made by Rodney Brooks, right, who is the guy who wrote the original papers on I didn't know that. subsumption architecture. He's the guy that started iRobot. Ah, okay. So subsumption architecture was this... Did you...? No, no. So, okay, so the subsumption architecture was very big in like the late 80s, early 90s. There's a critique of like the traditional way of, of designing robots, where you, you you looked at your you know the robot put all the sensors and looked at the room, and then you calculated where everything was, and you built up this accurate model, and then you decided what to do. And he said this is ridiculous. Biological creatures don't work like this. And mm. It's intractable. You can't make robots that work like that. So he invented what's called the subsumption architecture, which is essentially multiple modules or layers, each of which doesn't have to communicate with the other modules by sending information. All they do is they send information that was, you would, let's say you were doing something really simple like wall following, that was obviously the classic example. Yeah. So what you'd have is you'd have one module that said, go forward until there's something in front of you. And if there's something in front of you, you'd stop. You'd be, you don't want to go forward anymore. Mm -hmm. and then you'd have another module that said, oh, if he's not moving, start rotating to the, you know, if he's not going forward, start rotating to the right. So the communication between those two modules was not via some kind of message passing. Well, I mean, it might have been, but you know, it wasn't conceived as being like making a decision that was based on all these complicated things. It was like the first Separate one was just entities. Yeah, like that. and in fact, the, the the secondary modules would react to what the first modules were making the body do. Mm -hmm. So, so you got a whole bunch of behaviours in a pile, like a bunch of rocks chucked in the pile, yeah. and there's no yeah. fixed. They're not communicating with each other, they're all communicating with the environment, but communication with each other through their environment. Yeah, exactly. That was the idea. Through the body. That was and that kind of was one of the big influences of this whole body cognition so, stuff, which goes with people up, right? Yeah. The body cognition. Alvin Noah would be very was one of the main sort of roboticists who did that in the mm -hmm. 80s. And then he went off in the 90s and started iRobot, which yes, now utterly shamefully now made you know, weaponized robots for the US military. Um, but I think he might have left before that. I'm not sure if he was, he probably still I, gets money from it. I find I if he still runs the it. Roomba website hilarious, because there's a little link, it's you know, all nice and cozy <coughs> in people's front rooms. 
and then you find a little link, and then suddenly you go to this really dark, evil area, um, <laughs> where it's completely military and heavy graphics, and, and it's the real heavyweight <laughs> stuff that's there. It was literally by accident when I clicked it. I mean, the so robot does kind of go and, I mean, it was originally like a bomb disposal robot. Yeah, I'm saying. On the tracks that went through. But then well, some you, you can just, you can feel it. the way it's designed, <laughs> the way each, and I think, mean, yeah, that's coming obviously from the sort of programmatic way of thinking. It's designed. Like, everything's a separate module, and you can just slide out, you can slide out one wheel, which has got its own motor attached with a little chip, and so each bit is instantly replaceable. But, yeah. You can't get a gun for it. Wouldn't surprise me at all. I'm not sure it's made by a robot. Oh, right, okay. Well, no, actually, they did. They used the same technology for the Roomba as the basis of like a security guard robot that kind of wanders the. You know, it's the same algorithms and the same base. It's just it's like a cheap robot to walk around the corridors. That's what people thought it was in the shopping centre. They thought it was a security system and the police arrived. <laughs> Combine the two, you know, have a security uh, Hoover. Yeah. So I was looking <laughs> to try and find sort of places that the Vitaly was operating, and then suddenly it became apparent that, of course, when you start to lose a signal on a mobile phone, that's when the Vitaly is starting to struggle. So when you're lifting your hand up trying to find a signal, that's because the Vitaly is breaking. The Vitaly, in that sense, is. It's software, but it's not because it's hardware, because it's a chip that's embedded in my billions of mobile phones and wireless devices. Yes, it's a sort of physical form of the algorithm that's there. It sort of sense that it's there because you're not getting signals. I went and built a basic radio transmitter. That's a spark gap transmitter. It's a bit more there. Just using a, just an ignition coil from a car. And so it's kind of it's the earliest, one of the earliest forms of radio. I, I want to inject noise into my environment to, create, to disrupt mobile phone signals. It interrupted the digital TV signal that happened to be on. So when you get blocking and things breaking down and where you're not getting a clean signal, that's, you're starting to get a sense of that's the bit of the algorithm, not managing to get all of the data that it wants to, that it wants to get. That was kind of the lead-up research on the voice recognition project that I did. Create a small installation in an old, it's an old reception room at Goldsmiths University in an old swimming bars. Two servers that I created. One was a radio server, which on Hacker Day I went and read that people had managed to hack really cheap USB um, TV reception sets. So these cost a tenner, and they've got a little chip on them that you can communicate with using software called GNU Radio. And GNU Radio is a software-defined radio, which is part of cognitive radio technologies, wireless technologies, which has started coming about. And with this little stick, you can tune into an incredibly broad range of radio signals and have your computer do the processing. So if you've got um, the right kind of antenna for receiving that particular type of radio wave, then you can write something which can decode it. So you can use that to see um, mobile phone communications, pages if they're still about, and satellite communications, um, yeah, AM, FM, all of these kinds of things. So it's a really... So this is software radio? Software radio. So basically programming the radio to tune into things. Yeah, exactly. This, this, generates a, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on it, I literally followed some instructions that somebody posted a couple of weeks, uh, so a couple of months ago, and managed to get it working quite quickly. It works on reasonably old computers, and um, would work much better on a more modern computer. So you've got this radio server that can tune into different radio frequencies, and then I've got a speech recognition server here. I found an open source project called CMU Sphinx, which is a speech recognition mm -hmm. software, which is really straightforward to use, and started playing, installed it, started playing around with it to see what it could do. It was rubbish um, in terms <laughs> of <laughs> decoding speech. Um, it's kind of those sorts of things that they're designed for a specific person. You train them so they get to a specific person. It's incredibly difficult to get any single voice. So a lot of these systems have training systems in them, so they get better and better and better. I know technology is advancing massively, and there's huge developments in that area, 
and certainly, what's it, dragon naturally speaking or whatever, that does a pretty good job just off the cuff and it sort of give, gets you in the ballpark and stuff. But there, uh, there are some things for mobile phones I've seen recently, like that you can supposedly text through speech, like you, you tell it and then it will text something. I've never tried it. Yes, yeah, Siri. For it sounds like a really good source, like potential poetry or something. Yeah, yeah. Like. Oh, it's in terms of the poetics that come down, it's, it's brilliant. It's it depends what it's trained on. I had um, a go with Dragon yeah. uh, some years back. And it was really weird. You, you can put your own files in with your own previous documents so it knows what word sequences to expect. But when it comes out of the box, it has some really strange habits. <laughs> 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 they trained it on a combination of internal IBM documents, which are mostly about flights to Frankfurt, because the number of times Frankfurt air mm. comes up. <laughs> um, poetry, because uh, there's probably a load of it public domain, so yeah. clouds, clouds and flowers, well, clouds and flowers, Frankfurt airport, and I think they probably also seem to have fed in a whole load of uh, penthouse litters or porn into it. <laughs> <laughs> Say something teenagers that have come out with Frankfurt flowers and then something crude. Yeah. Uh, so mm. that's, I think they fed into it before they just gave I've, it to the general I've got public. a sense of that because serious things. <laughs> I, I tested it out just with a microphone into the laptop, and the word that it picked up again and again um, and did it really successfully was money. <laughs> no idea. It was really accidental, um, and and it was, there were certain people. It'd be absolutely amazing with it. It was really quite striking how well it would how it, it would transcribe their speech. And other people, myself included, is absolutely useless. So, so maybe they trained it on a whole load of motivational speeches on YouTube. <laughs> about how you can be successful quite in business. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a yeah, there's an open source project to create. A collaborative platform for speech recognition, so you can upload transcriptions. So the more information that it has, then the better it can. Is there one? Yeah, yeah. What's the name of it? I can't remember off the top of my head. Okay, but okay. It, um, but that's certainly something in the back of my head. I think, oh, that'd be an interesting so, thing to. So what happens if you take one of these systems and you train it up to the nth degree on a very specific lecture subject or type of poetry, and then you just feed it noise? So, so there is a there is a Google do a thing where I don't know who you, um, if it's available in the UK. You just have to ring them up and say do director inquiries and it's free. And it was. And the reason they're doing that was because they wanted an enormous bank of people saying stuff yeah, yeah. in order to uh, train them. Well, that's we've seen you saying they had a, a model for French newsreader, and Russian newsreader, and British newsreader. There were particular language models. That's very interesting, actually. Yeah. Uh, I'm, what? <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm speaking to everybody, and this is it thinking and trying to work something out. So everything's highlighted until it thinks it finds the end of the sentence. There we go, it's just doing a simple keyword search. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so there we go, it's obsessed with money, and there's a list of keywords. <laughs> Which include things like debt, income, one, two, three, four, five, one billion, two billion, three billion, <laughs> all of those kinds of things. And then when it finds the end of a sentence, out billion, out eight, out money, out one, out rate, out rate, out three. So, <laughs> so that was the morning thing. Son, the man was calling the end of the sun. He <laughs> likes the word sun, actually. Out one. <laughs> Um, okay. So, that, so you've got it looking just for these certain things now that it's living financial. Financial stuff, just because um, it was literally, as you say, it was, it was it was a random discovery that it seemed to like money. That was uh, and and words was, well, numbers. I thought, okay, it's probably going to be pretty good at numbers. You, you sort of try and get the basics in there, but yeah. It, um, uh, <laughs> so it's getting that from what you're saying at the moment? Yes, yeah, it's picking up what I'm saying at the moment. Out one. And <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, I played around with this speech recognition system and I got it to trigger the radio stuff. That's the free current frequency that the radio is tuned into. It's not turned on yet because it's... Oh, the 87600... Out one. 600 out zero, zero. Here we go. 
Is that true, don't you? Uh, it's a lovely sound. Let's that's it, it tried to tune into something. Yeah, there we go. So now I've turned on the radio server, which is here. That's what I was going to say. If it's on techno on a radio station, it would go, it's up, it's up, it's up, it's up. So it would really get the music. Uh, it's like the, you see these German guys that, that made a drum machine out of speech generation software. They had quite a bit of speech generation software, and they, it was, I think, Google or someone had it online, and then they found out if they just put in a certain set of, of characters, they just got this completely sort of techno sort of sound coming out of it. I think I remember seeing, yeah, yeah. You, you wrote down particular things and it would be... You, you're right. Yeah. Yeah, it's only like, I can't remember what it was, but you, you did get sort of from quite good. So you feed this back in, you know, into that somehow. Well, I amazingly, with, with a really simple instruction, which was, wait around for 20 seconds. Oh, if, if, if you don't find any conversations which have, or if you don't identify any of the keywords, then tell the GNU radio server to switch frequency. Mm -hmm. And amazingly, it hovered around Radio 4 and LBC, sort of talk radio So I was amazed, with literally such a simple yeah. if statement, it actually travelled around really well and you know, identified places of speech. Came up with absolute gibberish. Yeah, no, but that's, 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 that's one module, right? You know, now that module tubes in. Exactly. Yeah, module doing something else. In the actual installation, I found I tried to plug together as many different types of medium as possible. I just wanted to get across this sense of the to be algorithm is connected and operates you know, across a wide variety of technology. So I found an old CCTV um, observation system that happened to have a little speaker on it. So when it announces it's found mm -hmm. something, it was speaking out of the CCTV, and it would put up a little printer. In fact, that used a Raspberry Pi just as the background on that. Yeah, we really dressed the room. To, <laughs> or dressed it down, so it created a real tale of misery. Because you couldn't quite tell if it was a computer server room, if it was still a porter's room or not. There were old betting slips around. I found a letter of redundancy in, in you know, the port had obviously been made redundant, and these betting slips absolutely everywhere. So trying to sort of, <laughs> sort of give the sense of okay, there's somebody here that's desperately trying to find cash here, and to just try and get it to integrate as many different things as possible. Mm. I had a, a little receipt printer, so every time it found something, um, it would print out the frequency and the sentence that it's founded on. So it was all there, yeah, I was trying to get it to intersect with as many different types of systems as possible. Oh, and that's the mobile version. I found a shopping trolley. Shopping trolley. Shopper seat, that was it. What's that thing on the top? Oh, that's a little, just a mini PA unit I found in a skip, so it was amplification. I had the car battery in here to power my laptop and to power, power that. So I took it to Chelsea College, College of Art and there's a performance there in the parade ground. So I was able to put my system there and plug it into a big PA as well. Fantastic. Yeah, so trying to make it as mobile as possible. And that is it. <laughs> <laughs> Hurrah! <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Because I imagine there might be lots of algorithms that underlie are there, is there like a universe or was this just the first one you came across? Or? That's um, um, fast Fourier transformations. That's uh, another algorithm that's a really key one that's sort of helped expand digital signal processing. Yeah, I've come across the box, I've never heard of this yeah. um, I imagine there's, yeah, this, what's it? The travelling salesman problem, trying to identify the shortest path through mm -hmm. uh, any number of nodes. That's another key um, algorithm or set of algorithms that associated with our nodes. So I think we've got a few key ones. I, that I mean, is it actually a version of a Markov 
building a hidden Markov model, or is it? It, de it, like it decodes a hidden Markov model. It, um, it, you have well, you have convolutional encoding and Viterbi forward and backward algorithms work in tandem with hidden Markov models right. um, in order to operate. So there are way there are particular way of, of manipulating and building those models. Yeah. Um, so, so they have to agree beforehand for what they're going to use. Isn't yeah, they? that's the whole that's the whole thing. I suppose when it's doing speech recognition, it's got a rule of grammar highlighted, and it's the text is changing. That's because it's getting more audio, and it's going, okay, if that word's in, then the previous stuff doesn't make sense, so I need to juggle things around. Right. So, yeah. so you, that's why it was really nice seeing that text output. Just so that text is, is just its best guess at the moment. Yeah, so yeah. It's building you know, hundreds of those behind the scenes. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So if you ask at any one moment, what did the last thing you received mean, you will say, you're not sure, you need to get the next few. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and it, it does it roughly sentence by sentence. It sort of it looks, it does it until it finds a gap. But in um, a larger sentence context, and then larger, larger context. It's yeah, it's funny. What it does is it would sometimes get stuck on um, static, or it gets stuck on a, a particular sort of pirate radio station. It kept sort of getting stuck on for some reason, where it just continually be thinking. You know, suddenly it would have perhaps 50 words, and then it would reduce down to two words. And so I don't know quite what's going on there. It's sort of thinking, God, can't want to get out and start again, or... So it must feel like a very nearby path that could be like, so eventually it goes up there. Like, okay, yeah, even... But it builds a bigger and bigger and bigger... But the model path. could kind of still be you know, a long, long sequence. Yeah. There's many things that join together to make bigger bits of yeah. projects join together to. That's yeah. that's the key thing about the bit of it that, it, that it's working on and, and analysing. So that's when you see it, it doesn't use more and more and more memory. It's really efficient in the way that it right. does that. In that it goes, okay, this is my available data now. Forget all the past calculations. This is where we are. And so it goes moving average. Benefit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't understand the intricacies of it. I mm -hmm. got to see the GCSE maths. <laughs> can can I ask? Can I ask? Um, how do you see your role? I mean, in, in this as an artist, um, have you? Are, are, are you? I mean, is it a um, mechanical role? I mean, a curational role? Something else? What, I what? see my um, in terms of what you did is uh, um, how do I see my role? Um, it was a, an exploratory process to try and understand these abstract processes that are going on in the background that obviously have a huge effect in constructing the world that we live in. So I don't quite understand what you mean by well, in, 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 in terms of like um, your activity. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, the way um, I see it, and maybe it's it's a very r wrong way of seeing it, that it, that you you have, in a sense, uh, uh, curated a certain um, set of technologies, or, um, technologies, maybe uh, an algorithm can kind of curated them in a sense into yeah, a it's... certain show, yeah, that that does. X. That's. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm um, trying to, I'm trying to uh, go so. Uh, no, I'm, 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 I'm not. No, no, I'm. I'm sorry, sorry. Of course, of course. Decided on being a piece of art, as opposed to Oh, that, that's that's well. A curatorial role can be um, well. You, you can can just collect a few bits and pieces and say, this is. After I collected them, that that makes it art, yeah. Um, or <laughs> because I I put the yeah uh, I it it doesn't necessarily mean that I curate previously. Pieces of art, if you like, previously known pieces of art. Well, they'd be 
It's a pretty pedantic point. Uh, it, <laughs> uh, no, no, no. It, it's, it's a good one. Okay, it's it's uh, let let's say okay, maybe Q, Q, um, uh, the artist is a, a a collector. Okay, a collector and an exhibitor in the sense that you you exhibit stuff. Is that uh, I'm asking because I'm 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 trying to uh, kind of understand it in in uh, in less kind of technological and more. Uh, kind of cultural, artistic so, um, terms, if you like. What I'm trying to do is try and find where these sorts of technologies are breaking down or not quite working. Because where you start to find where these technologies aren't working, I think that's the primary point that they start to change how you act and what you do. And might be a bit out there, kind of looking for what what's the politics of these wireless technologies, what's their political effect and deep social effect, how mm -hmm. does it tie mm -hmm. into neoliberal capitalism, what kind of world are these technologies constructing? Then that, just on that note, if you're interested in, in the critique and the political role of these things, yeah. Why is it so interesting to look at them breaking down? Isn't it actually interesting to look at them even when they're functioning, these things? Uh, because where they break down is the point that people have lost what they think is control over those technologies. And right, the point so we're, we're, going, we're going back to the con who controls what yeah. and whatever. And, and for that, for me, that's perhaps a point where you can start to um, challenge dominant political... So in a sense, it's, it's one of the big things to notice is exactly, you know, here, I found this algorithm, and guess what, this algorithm is obsessed by money. Yeah. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us that, you know, a lot of our texts that people trained this on were for business purposes, the, but the content of them tells us. I mean, is, is that the oh, thing that kind of getting shown here through some of this work? It's... Well, for the, for, well, where I'm at with that project, I suppose, is, okay, this algorithm it intersects with lots of, it, it intersects into the financial world, and it has a bet mm -hmm. um, in terms of how that financial world is constructed. And it reveals that there's an awful lot of automated algorithms thinking about money, yeah. which perhaps we wouldn't normally imagine. And at a very practical level, it's an algorithm that's, managing calculations to do with what happens in the air and that manages how we move and how we move affects um, our sort of day-to-day -day transactions on a personal level, on a financial level. Okay. Um, how we move, are you saying that there's also something about these algorithms that corresponds to let's say biological processes in other words we're, we're looking at a sort of portrait of ourselves here yeah I'm, I definitely say the dynamics um, of these sorts of technologies particularly wirelessness are very similar to biological mm -hmm. processes mm -hmm. in, in terms of the sort of complexity of them and how they operate There's, I did a, a lot of research around the Olympic sites and looked at what the wireless infrastructure of the Olympic sites see how that's constructed and the big thing for me that came really apparent is because you, it's an area that's surrounded by railways, surrounded by water, that actually has a really big impact on how wirelessness is controlled on that site. And that's created the conditions for BT to have a monopoly of wireless signals. You mean if, um, if it was less isolated, mm, then it would have been much harder? It'd be, it would be a different thing, and it would, cr and a different type of economics would be created. Okay, okay. No, it's not. It's no, it's not part of the plan. I think it, it was. I think that was the nature of that space, and so, so, BT has got. Okay, that's the nature of that space. Oh wow, that's provided an opportunity. What's laughable is then. Having a little logo at the entrance of the Olympic, I didn't go to any Olympic games, I just hovered around the outside. Yeah, men with big guns that are there. Um, mm. Particularly if you've got a weird mm. device that's. Breaks down radio communication. Yeah, it's where was I going with that? They did have a sign that said no scanners. That's yeah. And well, it's no. 
personal um, sort of Wi-Fi, ad hoc sort of Wi-Fi network points. And there's a guy walking around with a device, pointing around, trying to find personal transmitters because you pay your 10 quid, right. whatever it is, for the day to have wireless access on the site. Yeah, is that, is that what the deal was? That's what, yeah. <laughs> but if you, walk, if you walk up to there, um, <laughs> T's got their supposedly open network, and there's thousands and thousands and thousands of those signals, but they're closed off. And then you've got the mm. old open kind of thing. But as soon as you go into through the Westfield Shopping Centre, into that area, those other wireless signals can't get through to that area. It's a bit too far. It's, it's got um, a lot of electromagnetic interference from overhead electrical cables and things like that. And so you've actually got this contained space, and that's created by the architecture of the space, rivers, and what's already there. So that's kind of me uh, getting back to uh, But it's... So I, I don't know. Okay. You've gone there with your spark gap, spark gap machine. You could have knocked out the Olympics and there wouldn't have been any... <laughs> 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 yeah. can, can, can I just... Can I just ask you, isn't there some sort of internal contradiction going on here? Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, the, um, you see, in in the sense that you, you, on one hand side, you're kind of uh, you're saying, hey, you know, guys, uh, when you design these uh, um, technologies and you think that they will have certain, no, 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 they have life of their own, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, fair enough. But then. You go on and say, "Hey, but uh, you know, I'm trying to um, uncover certain, uh, if you like, hidden language, if you like, uh, mm -hmm. hidden processes uh, behind our lives." Yeah. And and guess what? If uh, if they were visible, then you know, maybe life will be. Then you you start your own mythology. No, because I'm okay. not saying I think you can't understand everything and you can't make it all visible because you can't understand the complexity of all these things. Mm -hmm. And we've got our particular model of the world um, and all we know is our experience of the world and how it impacts on us, how it impacts us cognitively, physically. Um, and that's, that's all that we can know. And we can build um, scientific models of the world which are proved Mm -hmm. Proved true through experimentation until they're no, they they, they they prove n not well, untrue. Uh, untrue <laughs> yeah. But, um, so yeah, does that answer? No, well, you, you you did say earlier, hey, you know, um, you know, things would have been very different. You you, you did say that. But in what way? What in, in, in the sense that, that, that uh, say, if, if the BT element was, say, visible, then it would have been maybe different um, in, in, in a certain poli from a very certain political no, point of view. Yeah, I wasn't putting across okay, that. Okay, maybe, um, maybe I, I misunderstood was, you. What I was putting across is that you've got multiple layers of influence that have created the conditions under which BT mm -hmm. um, have got monopoly of uh -huh, wireless signals okay, over okay, the okay. sites. And it's not just the evil capitalists or them running in and having control. There's something else, it's the fact that it's the architecture of the space. Um, that it is seen that, legitimate. That, that, that is part of it. It's also these other kinds of politics, but mm -hmm. you've also got te existing technologies and all these other things that are having an effect on the economic conditions of accessing a sure, wireless or signal. Sure. So that's sort of where, and, like, and some of the stuff you can understand. You can understand because you can see where things are being blocked and you can measure the level of wireless signals. There's other stuff that we won't know why particular things have um, happened or occurred, and there's, you know, there's lots more material properties and things that we don't. So, look, understand to sum up my question, I guess, do, do you think the stuff that you're doing? has a certain effect that you kind of design into it? Does it have a certain effect that I design into it? Um, that you would well, have liked it to have? I, yeah. Does well, it have a meaning? I hope um, people start to think about these sorts of technologies and the effect that it's having on them. I hope that these kinds of talks and discussions are interesting because I certainly learn a mm -hmm. lot from them. And, and it's an opportunity for me to test out my mm -hmm. ideas and sort of experimental stuff. And I help 
to gain a deeper understanding of what these technologies are doing on a social cultural level. That's my sort of primary mm -hmm. primary focus. I'm also um, interested in how to make these kinds of things relevant to non-arts, non-technical audiences, to your normal everyday people on the street, which with this project I haven't, I haven't got there yet. <laughs> good. But that part well, this is a process. This project yeah, is a process. Yeah. That's no skill. I thought you were any audience. No, no, that sounds great. But you know, if you're trying to do it for people, it's not taking. I didn't understand that. Stephen Hawking was told like you lose ten percent of your readers for every equation in your book. So you have to kind of you know you have like three equations or something. People understand not being able to get a signal. Yeah, and sure. and their TV not getting TV reception, so that's perhaps an inroads to yeah. sort of investigate stuff. And I think speaking and working with people that are outside of technological or arts audiences gives you a better understanding of the social effect of these technologies because yeah. people know how they affect them. So I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. um, so if I can sort of develop means of doing that, that would be. You get quite a poor commentary otherwise. Think, the problem. Yeah. With, with artists trying to make a commentary about stuff, or actually that maybe not that they have a particularly sort of average view of it. Yeah. And you end up talking to other artists or other. Yeah. <laughs> other, other but then like, yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had quite a seemingly practical question that's to do with the concept, which is um, just at which point you'd consider it that project as an art piece. So if someone was, was just viewing it remotely over the internet. Whether that was, would be like the bare bones of the art piece, or whether you want it in the context of having the, the physical technology and then you had it in the room with a kind of staged kind of. Um, I, the, process, the process is the art project. Yeah. The fact that the second I started researching into this stuff and reading in mathematical documents, that's part of the art process. Other people reading stuff, or whether it's on the web, or me chatting to them. So you the see the art as a process? Yeah, totally. Totally. And it's not about having a finished product. You know, those sure. little experiments I've done, I think, don't want these things necessarily. To, I don't want to claim that, okay, that's it, that's done, because the world doesn't work like that. Because that's good being digital arts, you think, I don't know whether I'm a digital, I don't know whether I'm a digital artist. Or not, I'm sure I've got a bit of an identity crisis. I guess in terms of looking at digital culture, I think that once you're there, it's a bit weird to stick to this old idea of having a finished thing. It's like it actually comes more from I've done a lot of participatory arts projects, I've worked with younger people, mm -hmm. older people, lots of different groups video projects, sound projects, in drugs drop in centres, you know, all, all those kinds of environments. And from those kinds of projects are. Process there. It's not about the final thing that's created. It's about mm. the journey that that mm. individual has gone on. Yes and no. Yes and no. <laughs> 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 of I think because that if and and, and this is uh, I have to say uh, that, that it's part of my own self criticism of the stuff that I do. Mm. Um, that. I don't think we found a way, or at least I, I haven't and I haven't seen uh, maybe a, a way that, that, that um, actually uh, expresses the fact that it is a process. So in, in, that's in, 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 so in a sense, uh, you, we end up with certain objects, projects, uh, with, with certain, if you like, the, the, there are certain things, points, um, which uh, obscure the fact that it is a process, mm -hmm. uh, and that's the yes and no for me. You know, that that's for, for me. It's a, a very great challenge. One of the greatest challenges. Process. Sorry. What obscures the fact that uh, that you get um, uh, you you get to to have to. To do something, so a person. The, there is a certain, uh, uh, for example, set of objects, set of uh, 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 a technology, a show. Um, there is a something that, 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 in a sense, the the idea is that the process or processes led to 
or lead to. Yeah, and, 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 and object can be really important in participatory groups for people to mm. feel a sense of achievement. Mm -hmm. kind of thing. So, yeah, I agree. It's complete. It's a balance between process and. Well, for me, actually, no. I'm, I'm slightly more. No, because I think it needs to be more radical. I think it needs to be processism. <laughs> Like, like, just, just the. Let, let's see if we can get and just you the have process. A process without objects. You can't have a process without things. You can, you can. You, you, you have life. Life is a process without an object. It's full of, it's full of objects. Mm. It's full of birthdays uh, and marriages. And we are making them. We, we kind of, we're making like them. That. That's, a, that's an add-on. That's fucking, that's add-on. <laughs> let's make, let's make a pack. <laughs>